Hello everybody, this is uh, Drakinafel, as you probably guessed since this is a video on my channel. Now, today we're going to be discussing how the Royal Navy developed its cruiser of force and doctrine from the end of the First World War through to the start of the Second World War. So I'm afraid for those of you who want to learn about His Majesty's great machine gun, the HMS Minotaur theoretical design, we won't be covering that today, unfortunately. But well, we will be covering a number of other very interesting ships, and joining me is a uh, Dr. Alexander Clark uh, at AC Naval History on Twitter. He also has his own YouTube channel, which will be linked in the description below. I highly suggest you su subscribe there. So thank you very much for donating your time, and perhaps you just give us a brief introduction who you are. Thank you very much for having me. Um, well, my name is Alex Clark. I'm a naval historian by inclination, hobby, and life. Uh, I did my PhD at King's College London under Andrew Lambert, and I currently mainly teach history of engineering and academic skills at King's University, but I'm in the process of writing a book on tribal battle and daring class destroyers. I have presented far too many papers on cruisers, and I started a YouTube channel because, well, it was a longer term plan and happened. We you know we've got COVID-19 stuff going on, and I'd already started doing Twitter events, which had morphed into having videos for things like Outmark 80 and all these things. And then once you have those videos, you might as well put them somewhere for other people to go look at after it's done, which started a YouTube channel. And then I thought, well, I'm not doing that properly. So now I'm doing it properly, uh, as COVID-19 has given me the opportunity to spend some time at home and record some live stuff where I'm answering people's questions, which is quite yeah. fun. <laughs> yes, that's uh, that, I, that. I must admit that's been a, a great uh, thing for me to watch as well. So um, yeah, I do. Yeah. I do enjoy the question. So just uh, so everyone's aware, um, you've probably, hopefully, seen some of the videos that we've done previously in this format. So it's videos like the zero. So it's going to be a similar uh, format this time. I'm going to be asking some questions. Um, Dr. Clark's going to be providing the answers, and I might throw in the odd comment or additional question um, on the way. So, shall we begin then? So, the, it's kind of going to be a chronological thing, but we might jump around a little bit. So, first question would be, what was the state of the Royal Navy's cruiser force in the post-Washington Treaty environment? Obviously, you had Lexington, South Dakota, G3, N3, Amagi, Tosa, etc. cancelled. Did the Royal Navy have what it wanted or needed in terms of its cruiser force at that point, or did the treaty cause it to miss out on ships that it had perhaps designed but hadn't quite got around to building yet? The Washington Treaty is an interesting circumstance for the Royal Navy. What happens is prior to that, it's been built, most of its cruisers are legacy of World War I. They are, some of them are prior to World War I, but especially the C-class and D-class light cruisers coming through are legacies of World War I. So they are the epitome of World War I experience. But the Royal Navy is already going, hang on, these aren't necessarily what we need. But they also know that there isn't much funding. So they have the scenario where they're not necessarily getting the cruiser force they want built, but no one else is going to be building that as well which gives them time to take out to start thinking about what they need and what they want. And they start doing an aggressive series of exercises, uh, lots of study, lots of thinking, lots of retrospective investigation of events. So yes, they don't necessarily have the cruiser force they want, but they also are able to use the cruiser force they have to do most of the duties they want to do and to start working out what it is the cruiser force they need. And that's the important thing because the Royal Navy, the moment World War One ends, the Royal Navy starts thinking about the next war. And crucially, one of the first things they decide, and this is a study put through by Jellicoe and included by BT and all sorts of things involved, is that it's unlikely to be like the First World War. They are looking at the next World War. They've seen the First World War as being very European theatre-centric. They think in terms of naval warfare that any future war is going to be far more global because First World War had actually been global. It had had the battles of the Falklands, Coronel. It had operations with the Japanese at Tsingtao in China. It had had all sorts of stuff in the Mediterranean and, of course, the Dardanelles campaign and various things in to try and supply Russia. 
this meant that cruisers had had to go a long way. And so they were looking at a future war being global war. Now, this was then complicated by another scenario. The moment you lose the ability to build battleships, and that's what the treaties basically stop you doing. They stop you building battleships. You take a holiday. Yes, you're building Nelson and Rodney, but those are the only two you're going to get, and even they are compromised lines. So therefore, you, your cruisers suddenly become your status symbol. They're the ones which are the biggest ships you can build for status. So that puts a different emphasis on the cruiser. The cruiser force is not only going to have to fulfill the cruiser duty, they're going to have to fulfill the status and that's in many ways where the county class cruisers come from, because they are these big, beautiful statuesque ships. They're very, very much presence in mind and very much status in mind. And they're the globe trotting representations of British power. And that's what they need, because their Britain needs the status symbol to go around the world, as well as to do the cruiser duty. So you need to start balancing these two things, the cruiser duty and the status symbol. And that is going to affect the cruiser we built post-Washington. Right. So, well, I suppose that that kind of addresses a part of the second question, which was that with the first post Washington cruisers being the county class, what was their role in the fleet? So, I guess you've got yeah that status symbol role, but sort of expanding on on that further. Uh, I suppose everybody post Washington is mostly building eighty inch cruisers, so there's a certain logic there. But how did the Yorks play into that, as well as obviously the county's well general roles? To understand how the Yorks play into it, you have to go back to the beginning of the county. Now, the counties are actually also incredibly innovative in many respects. And one of the things is that the Royal Navy actually is almost thinking at this time as using its 8-inch guns for anti-aircraft duty. This is why the first batch of the county, their 8-inch guns can uh, elevate to 70 degrees. Now, we can all imagine the poor fighter pilot or single-seater aircraft pilot's face if an 8-inch shell goes past him in mid-air. It would not have been pretty, and probably what would happen to this aircraft wouldn't have been pretty if it had hit. But, leaving that to one side, the counties have a lot of innovation packed into them. And they're big, and they're beautiful, and they're all these they're everything the Royal Navy wants for going out to face off against the Japanese. They're going out in the, the Far East, to dealing with the Americans in the North Atlantic, to being a status symbol versus the Italians in the Mediterranean. These are the sort of fleets they're looking at. But the trouble is, the Royal Navy needs to get more of them for its tonnage allowance. And the Royal Navy likes to build right up to the limits of its tonnage allowance. And this is where the Yorks come in, because the Yorks are in many ways supposed to be the lighter, cheaper Type B cruiser the one that the Royal Navy can afford to get in far greater numbers that will provide convoy protection that in wartime. So if you consider them, the counties are your, in, in a maze, your post-Washington surface raiders. They're what the Royal Navy is looking at for doing its aggressive economic warfare in times. But the B type Bs, the York class, are supposed to be these vessels which are going to be protecting the convoy. They've got enough firepower that most surface raiders are going to keep away from them because a surface raider doesn't want to get damaged. If a surface raider gets damaged, it's got to go home. It's a mission kill. No matter how much of a win it achieves, it's a mission kill if it's damaged. So they have to sort of, they're sort of balancing these things. And the York class are in many ways a response to the greatness of the counties. The York class are meant to, to encapsulate the important parts of that for less. And as part of this, they're supposed to be using a lighter turret, which can't do the 70 degrees elevation, which actually turns out to be actually heavier. So it doesn't really work that way. But it was a nice idea. It, it had lots of good ideas to try and make it lighter. The trouble is none of them worked in making it lighter. They all worked very well as a turret. They didn't work in making it So given that, the, given that when you got to the World War II period, um, there were various upgrades very quickly uh, applied to the counties, such as uh, belt armor, um, upgrading over the boxed armor, and such like. Is that then an example? A, um, look, which looks very like a town class cruiser in terms yeah. of their superstructure uh, shape. Yes. So it, it is is that kind of upgrade given that it seemed to go pretty quickly, almost as if it was planned um, from the start? It was planned. 
Yeah, I was going to say, is, is this an example of deliberately fitting for but not with in order to comply with peacetime requirements in terms of displacement and such like with the treaties? To an extent, yes, but also it's to an extent of, and oh God, sometimes I do stand like a prophet for this guy. Um, Admiral Henderson, when he becomes third sea lord in 1933, is charged by the then first sea lord, the first sea lord Chatfield, with preparing the Royal Navy for war, and for a global war. And he does this by free strand. First of all, he looks at what the fleet needs in terms of ships and starts trying to build those ships for operations. Secondly, he starts in terms of what kind of equipment they're going to need in terms of weaponry and how you can refine and improve those guns. And that's where the 4.5 inch gun comes from eventually. And the, the one which produces the Mark VI, which post World War II is this amazing gun, which is fitted to everything because for about 40 years, it is the best gun system in the world and these sort of things. But also third strand is what can we do with the ships we have to improve them, to make them what we need them to be. And you get the C-class being turned into anti-aircraft cruisers because you need more anti-aircraft ships. And you also get plans for how to evolve the county. And it's no surprise that part of the plan for evolving the county involves what's the superstructure we've got for a cruiser, which is the best structure we have for doing the cruiser job at the moment. And it's the town class one. It's been developed for the town class. The town class are also roughly 10,000 tons. So they're roughly the same size and displacement as the counties. So therefore, you can take a lot of the ideas from the town class quite easily and retrofit them to the counties, and you have a modernised county which works really well. I see. So, yeah, that's uh, a good example of forward thinking there. Um, uh, so... it's, um, it's an example of forward thinking, but also it's an example of the Royal Navy going, we have to do with what we have available. You can't just... The Royal Navy knows that it can't fight a global war, and it is very conscious of the war. I did a, a video yesterday. The conversation was all about their plans for global war. And the Royal Navy's plans for global war were always based around the concept of we're going to end up fighting. How do we make the best the case we can for the ship form as part of our overall war? What are they going to be doing? And cruisers are critical for fighting a global war because you need them to do the convoy protection and you need them also to do the convoy interdiction i.e. the trade war so they're both sides that they're the shield and sword of the trade war and that's going to be critical in any global war because the whole point of a global war for Britain as an empire which was based around the world was to keep its trade flowing while stopping the enemy's trade being able to move around so their economies would crumble whilst its economy would keep going it's the same strategy which had worked against Napoleonic France same strategy which the British had used many, many times in their history, and it worked, what they were planning on doing. But cruisers are critical. So building on that theme, given that obviously everyone's building eight-inch cruisers in the 1920s, and then with the London Naval Treaty making the distinction between the heavy and light cruisers, suddenly you've got things like the Brooklyns, the Megamis, although we know the Japanese were actually planning on making them eight-inch later on. Um, but you've got all these six-inch cruisers appearing in the 1930s. Is this purely down to the London Naval Treaty, or is there also advances in technology that are perhaps persuading people that the six-inch is the way to go over the eight? It's quite simple. People realising about engagement. Um, if I just quickly, because I'm not going to try and remember this off the top of my head, Got it on Excel spreadsheet next to me. The gun range engagement ranges were normally, when you're talking about uh, when they're doing exercises, they were finding out that most of the engagement ranges were around about 18 kilometers at the maximum. So the the Royal Navy is looking at sort of 18,000 meters as their roughly maximum engagement cruisers are going to be fighting a battle, and usually it's less than that. Usually it's less than 15. And so because they're dependent upon sight, they're not, they haven't got radar controlled gunnery in yet. And so they are still using visual aids. And that's what they're looking at. When you start looking at that, you start to realize that the eight inch gun, uh, cru uh, eight inch gun cruiser, because of the rate of fire you can achieve with an eight inch gun versus six inch, 
only has an advantage in the first salvo, in the first minute. The moment the fighting goes on longer than a minute, the six inch guns, especially if you have enough of them, i.e. you're a town class with 12, you will start to outpace them. Now, the problem is, when you are first looking at this and the six inch gun, navies are looking at how to, again, maximize their tonnage usage, their lance usage. And the Royal Navy is definitely in really keen on this. And you get the Leander class, you get the Arafuse class. Um, you get these sort of these small, uh, small cruisers which are focused on trying to eke out every ton you can from your tonnage allowance. But they, of course, have fewer six-inch guns. They have usually eight of them. And, you know, these things slowly work and slowly help them sort of... They, uh, but the trouble is with eight turrets, uh, no, with eight guns in four turrets, the same as the county class, they actually are never going to achieve the full use of their range of firepower and they can't really maximize their firepower until you start looking at the tower the later designs which are sort of the four treble turrets the 12 guns and then they can really really outpace the county that's the towns in light of those uh those ideas we when everyone's building these sort of 12 and 15 gun six inch cruisers the Royal Navy is obviously building the Leanders and the Amphians um, and the Arethusers with the, the, the six six inch guns. So, what exactly is their role within the Royal Navy? Um, because obviously, we've, we're, we've, there's all sorts of ideas advanced there for convoy protection, trade protection, um, et cetera, but it, it seems slightly illogical to have a cruiser that is purely designed to see off sort of converted armed merchant cruisers and stuff like that. Um, so I'm sure they had some other role in, in mind for them as well. Well, you have, but a light cruiser, it has four potential roles in war. Okay, it can be the scout for your main force. It can be your trade protection vessel. It can be your presence vessel in secondary theatres i.e. the South Atlantic. And it can be your destroyer leader, your flagship for the Rear Admiral destroyers. So it's the ship which can, a cruiser which can best match destroyer performance specs, so it can go in with them to provide firepower and fire support. Now, the trouble is with the latter option, that whilst it's a nice idea and whilst it had been used a lot in World War One, as destroyers themselves grow in size, and especially when you get the tribal destroyers come in, that doesn't really become a useful role in World War Two. It's not really one which is used. In fact, the rear animal destroyers tend to be find themselves as a sort of task force commander, often commanding from battleships or heavy cruisers and having a whole force under their charge. Most famously, Rear Admiral Burroughs in the Mediterranean and other things ends up doing that quite a bit. For the other duties, they are perfect and they are necessary. If It's going to sound very, very sort of big theory here and weird theory, but sometimes the most important parts of war are not just the front and main theatres. For the Royal Navy, if it lost control and lost presence in a secondary theatre, i.e. the South Atlantic and other areas like that, it would have been facing major problems in terms of diplomacy, because British diplomacy, British presence in the world, and the support it could guarantee from the rest of the world, was mostly based upon the Royal Navy will still have effective command of the ocean, effective ability to use the oceans at will, and therefore, if you want to continue your global trade, you need to keep us on site. It's done in a very nice, very diplomatic, very dinner party manner. But it means that the South Atlantic is critical for that. Yes, there's the Treaty of Panama. And yes, there's these sort of scenarios which take place. And there are various things in Africa as well. But if the Royal Navy needs to maintain presence there, because otherwise the British government would be at a massive disadvantage. 
ships. So having ships which are powerful enough that if a surface raider does show up, they can fight them. Again, like they did at the River Plate, a pack, but they did it, is useful. But their main principal role is actually by, as part of the sort of the 70 cruiser strategy of world fighting, is actually to provide that extra support in the background to make sure those secondary theatres do not get lost, do not get dropped. And that's a critical role for the nation, national security in terms of getting the supplies and getting the support it needs from other nations. Now, that's very interesting because often you tend to hear comments like they were only good for convoy escort duty, like any other cruiser would have beaten them in a fight. Some destroyers could have beaten them in a fight. They were useless, etc., etc. They were critical yeah. for that, though. You needed them. And also, and please add this bit in. The thing you always have to remember when you're dealing with surface radar is that a surface raider, especially a scenario like the Graf Spey, operating so far away from home, the moment it gets damaged, it's a mission kill. So these ships are carrying torpedoes. These ships carry their six-inch guns. And yes, six-inch gunfire does a lot of damage to the Graf Spey. You can tell that by the report from the Uruguayan authorities, because some of the directions and areas the shells have hit could not have been done by Exeter because she wasn't in the position to do it. So they were getting damaged by six inch shell fire. They were getting, they had the threat of torpedoes to deal with. These yeah. are things which cause a lot of trouble for them. And if a mission, if a, it doesn't matter for the Royal Navy uh, whether that grass bay is sunk or if it's just badly damaged, because the moment it has that, it either has to seek port in the South Atlantic, in which case it's going to be effectively mission killed, because even if it does get out, by the time it gets out, the Royal Navy will be there and they'll be waiting in force and they will take it down. Or it will have to try and limp home. Either way, it's no longer causing trouble for the Royal Navy in the South Atlantic. So the Royal Navy, these ships, yes, if you're looking at them in a top trumps fashion, they do not match up. But they don't need to match up. It's the Royal Navy, in a way, applying the risk fleet strategy that the high seas fleet applied versus the grand sea, uh, the grand fleet. I.e., yeah. if they, if they are enough, they, if they are enough combat power, they could cause you damage. You don't want any damage. You'll keep away from. Them. Yeah, and I suppose that's the thing is that yeah, anyone can point to say the river play and say, oh yes, well the sixteen shells bounced off the Graf Spee's main arm belt or whatever. But there's an awful lot more systems on a warship that aren't behind the main armor by the time of world war ii that any anything that happens to those can be equally critical i'm, I'm sort of thinking like maybe in the, the last the last battle of, of bismarck rodney taking out its fire control system so early for example and uh, norfolk sheffield and belfast doing the same thing to shan horse these are things you can't you cannot uh put under four five six inches plus of armor um, but a six-inch shell is just as capable of taking, of wrecking those um, on a ship like Graf Bay as anything else. And the biggest damage to the Graf Bay was its water distillery plant, and it's 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 galleys. Yeah, How can't you go anywhere without that. If you can't feed them or water them. Yeah, I suppose yeah, with it with its diesel conversion plant and its uh, water distillery plant out of action, it wasn't going anywhere fast. No. Yeah. So, so at that point, yeah, it's it's yeah. at that point the six-inch gun. It doesn't matter. Yes, in the nicest way, a one-on-one -on -one fight, Graf Spey should have whipped a, a six-inch destroyer, a six-inch cruiser. But and the reason I fought destroyer there is because, of course, there's the famous mm -hmm. line where you know they uh, they think they're engaging a dest uh, two destroyers and a cruiser because of the way they're being handled. Now, this actually idea comes from. Harwood, looking at what Henderson's been talking about um, at Greenwich, about the tribal class destroyers and them being used as cruisers. Well, the idea goes, if you can use a destroyer as a cruiser, you can use a cruiser as a destroyer. And that is literally what they're doing. That tactic where he divides and starts to ensnare, that would look strange to maybe some, but if you were a destroyer commander from Model 1, if you'd got any experience in destroyers in Model 1, that was your standard tactic. Your most powerful unit goes one side to fix, the others pair off and go and attack from the other side. That was what the forces down in... Oh, the... Um, 
I'm forgetting it now. The force down in the south. I'm trying to remember the name. Oh, under twit. Harwich Force were specialists in. The Harwich Force was obsessed with doing that, and they did it very well. And this is what they're doing. They're doing at the Battle of River Plate. They're doing what the Harwich Force would have done to a superior opponent with destroyers. They're, but they're just doing it with cruisers. And it works. Right. So um, <laughs> I suppose that, that brings us around to our, our next question, which is that I know. So I, I think we've covered a lot of this, but obviously in the latter part, sort of mid to late 1930s, when everybody's heading back to building eight inch cruisers um the japanese obviously building the cows and the tones the uh, americans building the new orleans uh or however they're pronouncing it these days the royal navy is obviously bringing out the town class with its six inch guns we've covered the sort of the split between the six and eight inch contemporaries already but um outside of the the, the rate of fire versus an eight inch gun cruiser what is the primary purpose of the town class within Royal Navy fleet doctrine? Where where do they envisage using them? They're surface raiders. Everywhere through, they're marketed as the anti-surface raider ship, the ship which will go out and save uh, trade lanes with their aircraft and hunt down surface raiders and sink them. But all those same skills, and if you think about it, are actually make them also excellent surface raiders. And they're actually used more often as surface raiders, famously HMS Liverpool during the Asa Mamaru incident, where she picks out this Japanese liner in the middle of the ocean, not far actually from the Japanese coast, and goes, we're taking the German passengers you've got aboard who are German merchant sailors off you now. And there is nothing you can do about it. This is what they were for. They... The Royal Navy politically could never procure anything which was called a surface. They couldn't. It would look bad. It wouldn't go for a fly. And it was also considered an, a, a emittance of weakness. But the Royal Navy knew they needed them because they needed them for economic warfare and for global war, for fighting a war on a global scale. So that was where the town class cruisers came in. They were the surface counters. The, they were the surface raiders. They also were very useful counter-surface raiders, and they were very useful for exercises in when the Royal Navy was trying to practice its counter-surface raiding tactic. And in World War II, they found themselves being used a lot as flagships, as the vessels which were providing a lot of firepower in fighting forces in the Mediterranean and in North Atlantic. They were critical during the Bismarck and Scarnhorse events. All these things, they find themselves useful, but Principally, every time it goes back to these ships, their role is to be the frontline cruisers and to be the epitome of what the Royal Navy needs them to be. And this is why they went with the six inch guns, because the six inch system allowed them to carry more shells and also make it slightly lighter so they could have more, they could have tonnage which they could allocate to other things. They could allocate it to machinery plant, they could allocate it to armor, they could allocate it to all the things that other things that the ship needed to be a very good all-round cruiser. And this is because the cruisers are starting to add in things like directors, like all sorts of systems which are getting far bigger and far heavier. And one of the interesting things you find in town class is they've got a lot of stuff put in place for providing them electrical power, which proves critical when radar comes in. Because they've got this inbuilt stability in them. They've got the space in the hull to put it in. And they wouldn't have had that if they'd taken the same hull and put in 8-inch and the machinery for 8-inch. Because you'd have had less tonnage available for that, that sort of machine. You'd have had less space available for that sort of thing. Because the 8-inch turrets and the 8-inch gut shells do take up more space than 6 The other thing you also have to remember about the town class is they are designed to operate with the next generation of aircraft carriers. So whilst, yes, they do have the space for carrying multiple aircraft themselves, it's expected that they'll be operating in the Far East with HMS Unicorn. And Unicorn, of course, is not a light carrier. She's a forward aviation support ship. But she's the vessel which is going to replace Hermes and Eagle in terms of the Far East rotation, in terms of the China Squadron. 
Okay. Which makes sense because she's the one which is going to have almost the facility to support the aircraft out them themselves, which is what the Royal Navy's been having the main trouble with getting modern aircraft out to the Far East, has been actually providing the support infrastructure because the airfields out there aren't really built up to support modern aircraft. So okay, this so is this the Royal Navy basically... solution. It's a, it's a kind of a floating repair shop, effectively. Yes, it's a light carrier combined with floating repair shop that can mean, maintain your force at peak levels out in the Far East. And I that's what they've been known for. Yeah, I suppose that that's almost... Uh, I, mean, I know we're probably getting onto carriers rather than cruisers, but I suppose briefly that's, again, a, an example of a very different doctrine, whereas the, the American approach is string a bunch of spare parts and spare aircraft from the ceilings of our carriers to replenish them there and then on, on the fleet carriers. The Royal Navy's thinking more in terms of having its own an, a, sort of a, a completely dedicated ship to doing that behind the lines, which allows your your actual sort of your forward based fleet carriers that are getting involved in the, in the fight to just concentrate on on the actual action rather than worrying about having to do complex maintenance and repair all the time as well. And HMS Unicorn would always be moving with the fleet where it was. And remember, this is very important when you're a Navy which is going to be fighting the other side of the world from an industrial base. You can do the American technique when your industrial base is literally just the other side of the ocean. But when it's your nicest way, your industrial base is three oceans away, it's a different concept. Mm. It's a, you know, you've got all that travel time back and forth. So you have. The idea, I think, was that most aircraft were going to be brought into Singapore. And then from Singapore, they would be taken as a spare aircraft and all things would be aboard HMS Unicorn. And Unicorn would also be acting as a little light carrier, but also doing the maintenance and running backwards and forwards to the main fleet of the forward fleet. Now, that's in a major war. In peacetime, she would, of course, be supporting the cruiser forces, providing them with cover, all sorts of things forward in the China squadron. And she would have done that job excellently. And the Royal Navy could have possibly afforded to have deployed a second carrier out there to back up the cruiser force and probably would have done so if the if peace had continued into the 1940s. Yeah, because it's... it was very much a cruiser carrier partnership. The Royal Navy wasn't looking at just its cruisers for the cruiser role and wasn't looking at its carriers just for the carrier strike role. It was also looking at them as part of the economic warfare package about this, you know, this continuous in-air presence of scouting aircraft of having the strike to widen out the force. And the idea of having a cruiser carrier partnership try, carrying out economic warfare is very, very critical to the Royal Navy's ideas of how to prosecute a war against Japanese, especially in the early phases for a global war. And so you can't, in a way, it's nice to discuss cruisers as an individual. But honestly, you always have to discuss them as part of the whole force approach and what the Royal Navy is looking at the force to do. Because sometimes it goes, we don't need our cruisers to do this because we have this and this parts of our fleet. Which... And sometimes it goes, right, this and this aren't sufficient on their own. So we do need our cruisers to be able to do this. And one of those things where they do that is, of course, torpedoes. And Royal Navy keeps torpedoes on its cruisers far longer than any other Navy does because they are so critical as part of the Royal Navy's idea of offsetting any advantages that other navies might have in having larger guns on their cruisers. Because you're still going to get have to get in within the same engagement range, and when you get in that engagement range, you can also get hit by a torpedo. And if you make a big hole in a ship, it tends to sink. Yeah. So, with with that in mind, so when the Dido class is conceived, um, I know in actually in the videos I've done on both the Tribal and the Dido, they have this sort of common ancestor that splits to give a slightly larger version of itself, which becomes the Dido, and a slightly smaller version of itself, which becomes the Tribal, even though it starts out as a small cruiser. So where does the, that Dido class that eventually comes about actually sit within the, the, uh, the Royal Navy's plans? If they've, they've got the big eight-inch counties, they've got the rapid-fire six-inch towns and, and the various diminutives thereof for both. So where where do these ships come in as as the five point two five inch ships? Well, the five point two five ships are in many ways your AA cruisers. They're trying to maximise firepower versus aircraft, but they're also trying to maximise your firepower versus destroyers. And in to a certain extent, the Dados are 
a product of the Royal Navy needing task force cruisers. That's their theory. They're looking again at the ranges in the Pacific. They're looking at the ranges of putting a fleet around the world. And you, so you're looking at a, there's a small cruiser study, which is basically about building a task force ship. A ship which is going to protect carriers, protect battleships from smaller ships. And, you know, basically enable the carriers and the battleships to concentrate on engaging the enemy's carriers and battleships without worrying about being under attack. So the Royal Navy starts this small cruiser study. They also have an, the reason they're looking at a small cruiser for it is again they're trying to maximize tonnage. They're trying to maximize the amount of space they can get, the amount of shit, uh, hulls they can get for the tonnage they're allowed under the various treaties, and they are looking at sort of replacing the C's and the D classes, slowly built, getting rid of the World War One legacy vessels. So that's where the Dido is coming. Um, but this study does split down two ways. One, because the, the later London Treaty gives the Royal Navy this opportunity for destroyer leaders, which is amazing, as far as Henderson and a couple of us are concerned, because it allows them to build the big general purpose cruiserish fighting destroyers, which the Royal Navy needs for fighting in a lot of time. And the Dido's also get produced on a slightly bigger version, sort of this task force for ship. And they're both supposed to protect task forces. They're both supposed to be involved. And they're both looking at a war in the Far East. In fact, I, my, my instinct is often is that the Royal Navy was looking at a RAN flotilla of tribals even prior to World War II. And the Canadians were looking at a flotilla of them as well. And I have a feeling that even if war hadn't started, you'd have had the RAN flotilla out operating with HMS Unicorn or whichever carrier was out in the China squadron as that task force ship. And they might well have been joined by a Dido class as the sort of flotilla leader slash big muscle to protect that carrier. And that's very much what the Royal Navy is looking at. Also, the Dido class were supposed to be the vessels which would take on the rear admiral destroyer, uh, destroyer's role. But the big problem with this is sometimes I call tribal class destroyers to be cruiser destroyers because they have space, they have the shape, the form, the role of a cruiser. The Dido class in many ways could be called destroyer cruisers because they are so crammed full of everything. They are in the end the only way they can find for actually sorting out their top weight for actually putting stuff in is they have to start taking weapons off them because they are so crammed full of everything. The design is so full and packed in and densely occupied, it doesn't have the space for development as time goes on. And this is part of the thing with the bigger ships versus the smaller ships. When you're built, the reason the town class, the crown colony class, the reason these classes keep going and survive so long in service and provide the basis in many ways for the Tiger class and all the, the subsequent British ships, cruisers, they are very much a lot of space in them, allowing them to be developed, for them to be improved, for them to be modernized, for them to take on the new features and new equipment. Dido class don't really have that. They don't have the space. They are, as I said, destroyer cruisers. Yeah, and I think the Americans have had the same issue with the Atlantas, which kind of their rough equivalent thereof, in, in as much as, yeah. yeah, they got overloaded with equipment, they had to start deleting things. When the trouble is a cruiser has to do so many roles and has to be so independent to go around the world, you have to put a lot of equipment in it. And the moment you're putting this in to a smaller hull as you can fit it in, you then have no space for anything else. And even if you walk around HMS Belfast, which is the largest of the town class cruisers, you know, the largest type, her and Edinburgh, la the really big ones. They were the flagships, and I have a thinking suspicion they would have been the flagships of the China squadron. And probably the, probably you'd have had one in the Mediterranean and one in the China station if peacetime had continued, if it hadn't gone straight into war and the changes hadn't been made. You could go aboard it, you still feel there's a lot of densely packed machine spaces. There isn't a lot of free space. There's a lot of stuff crammed in there. 
there is though still much more than there was available on the Dido class. A lot more available class. And that's a, when you think about how little there is on the town class, even the largest of the town class, that really almost scares you when you think about how crammed the Dido class went. Yeah. So obviously that that the the Didos and towns and crown colonies are sort of the, the last pre war Royal Navy cruisers that, that get onto the stocks. But we know there are a number of speculative designs that indicated a return to the heavy cruiser format. So you've got the Surrey, um, some designs with triple eight inch turrets, and of course the infamous various designs with the 9.2 inch guns. So what do those plans reflect regarding Royal Navy thinking at the upper end of the sort of the cruiser firepower bracket? And how likely were they to have been built had war not broken out in the uh, sort of 1939, early 1940s. I have to say, I'm always skeptical about the 9.2 inch. Um, the main reason I'm skeptical about that is because the Royal Navy, the whole way in the 1930s, is very much setting down a path of trying to look at reducing the gists in terms of they've got a four inch high angle anti aircraft and a 4.7 inch main gun for destroyers. And they're trying to standardize onto a 4.5 inch so that they can have both and all the capital ships and everyone on the same gun. Admittedly, they then go against this by having the 5.25 inch for the Dido's class, but just consider them as special. The Dido's, they are trying to make a far better performance AA gun for a cruiser, and it's got to be a heavier anti aircraft gun. They try the six inch, they don't want to go through the mechanisms of the eight inch, and they settle on the 5.25 inch. They're not really happy with that from a logistics perspective, but it makes sense from a naval perspective. But this means I look at the 9.2 inch and I go, would the Royal Navy have really considered that enough of an advantage to take on another type of shells, another logistics train, all the rest of the issues to actually put it into service? I think it was looked at. I think it was studied. I think it was something which was definitely interesting to them. But I don't think it would have happened in under wartime conditions because they needed to pare down. They needed to keep the logistics going. For the larger eight-inch cruisers, they are a reaction in many ways to the fear of facing the Japanese and what they think they're going to be in terms of fighting. But as war goes on, uh, it's considered that the cruisers, especially the heavy cruisers, and the Americans building of even bigger cruisers. Remember, the Americans are building 14,000 ton super cruisers at this point, which are pretty much battle cruisers, but name. The Royal Navy is looking at them going, oh, perhaps we should build massive big cruisers as well. They're doing it. Why are they doing it? What are we building? What are they building it for? What? And they're looking at it and designing it. And every time they're looking at the point of, are we going to order this ship? And they sit down and decide not to. And it doesn't actually get followed through or it does get, you know, it, nothing gets past really the contract stages. And the reason is ultimately because the Royal Navy is going, well, what do we need these ships for? And what are we using our construction for? And is it really worthwhile us constructing or can we do it better with other ways? Can we fulfill this role better adequately with the cruisers we'll get building? And that seems to be the decision they make. They make the idea that the six inch cruisers they're building are more than adequate for the job. And when they do need a bigger ship for it, a bigger gun, well, you've got battleship. So if you want to build a battleship replacement cruiser, that makes sense. But the Royal Navy is building a battleship and it, they're not really building that because they don't, they're looking at it and going, do we really need? The answer is yes, we do need it, which is why they build HMS Vanguard. But their answer then is going, well, if we're building a battleship and we're building the, the bigger ships, do we need the 8-inch? Do we need the 9.2-inch cruiser? Remember? And at the moment, when you have enough working counties, you don't need it. I have a feeling that if... I have a feeling that if the British had been in better financial position post-Second World War, World War and had decided again to keep more of a navy and not cut it down quite so much i have a feeling then you might well have seen a eight inch cruiser maybe even a 10 inch cruiser 
appear in Royal Navy weapons terms, certainly potentially the 9.2, because post Second World War, when they're reducing cruiser numbers, if you are going to retain a heavy cruiser force, it makes sense to go for something with a decent gun caliber. And that's actually one of the reasons why, in the end, the cruiser idea of the having a cruiser armed with a load of Mark VI turrets of 4.5 inch doesn't work because honestly there's no chance of it working really versus the Stardock class which is what the Russians are building mm. so I have a feeling if the Royal Navy had been going cruiser and I do I have studied a lot of the response to the Stardock and the Royal Navy does three sort of things one they look at the cruisers they've got in the construction they start rapidly pushing them through and they start modernizing them and upgrading them secondly they produce the Buccaneer to make sure the carriers are capable against them and Thirdly, they're looking at their intelligence and their submarine arm. But they also are, do look at the crew, heavy cruiser options and look at dusting them off. And in the end, they decide they don't need to because they've got the other things to fit in the role. And the Royal Navy is very brutal in this part. They realize always they've got a limited amount of money and they've got to do a lot of work. So they always go, do we really need to do this role or do we have other things which already cover these duties? Okay. So. But they are nice to look at on paper. Yes. Yeah. And um, with regards to keeping with the theme of weapons, um, with the US Navy, obviously they ditched torpedoes from all of their cruisers by the Atlantas. The the Japanese Navy goes a little bit all in on the torpedo side um, with their cruisers. The Royal Navy has this sort of balance in as much as they, they retain their torpedo launchers. They don't carry quite as many as the Japanese, though. Um, so. What what's the thinking behind that kind of balance of uh, torpedo armament? The thinking behind this sort of balanced approach is always that the Royal Navy is looking at fighting a war, and they don't know what threat they're going to be facing. So any cruiser which meets a threat which it can't outrun and it can't outgun, a torpedo is always a balance of threat. A torpedo is always something they have to be worried about. But you don't want to have so many torpedoes, you limit your gun armament or you limit your performance of the ship in other ways because it's important to produce a balanced ship. The Americans, in many ways, getting rid of the torpedoes allows them to better balance their ships in other ways, machinery, armor, all sorts of things. Torpedoes are a lot of weight. The Japanese, by focusing so much on torpedoes, actually limit themselves. Well, they theoretically limit themselves, but if they were paying more attention, they were following the closely um the royal navy who are always trying to at least look like they are obeying treaties but when you look at the actual figures the royal navy occasionally seems to be a little bit um fast and loose uh the tribal class destroyers are a great example of this and that they're all supposed to be 1850 tons uh in terms of standard displacement I don't think i've found a single one which actually all seem to be slightly over by about 30 or 40, which is fine. It's fine. It's only 30 or 40 tons, but this is the Royal Navy who are supposed to be super law abiding and they're not. Um, and that, by the way, stat comes from reading the archives of the shipyards which were built, uh, which I trust quite a bit more than I trust sometimes. It's the same with the cruisers. The Royal Navy is looking at cruiser design looking at their crews of what they're going to do. They're looking at them as an offset strategy. They look at torpedoes as this offset strategy. And you've got to think about this in the, the times in the Mediterranean, the times that the Italian battleships are held off and don't engage, even when they have an advantage, because they're worried about the Royal Navy's torpedoes. They're worried about the damage they can do. And the, America, the Germans and the Italians are always very worried about losing ships because they have leaders who are obsessed with the idea of losing ships and seeing it as a massive loss to national prestige if you lose a ship. Whereas the Royal Navy seems to be in British governments uh, more pragmatic, i.e. we're going to fight a war, we're going to lose ships. We don't want to lose them, but we are. But they work out very quickly that having torpedoes aboard their ships and having a sort of balanced profile and having the torpedoes able to fire at sort of 360 degrees around the ship means that you're going to be less likely to lose those ships because no one really wants to close in to try and kill them 
because if you close into the closest range, they'd really wipe them out. They might get some torpedoes off and be lucky. Strangely enough, though, the Royal Navy has this theory, and yet it's the Italians who actually managed to enact this uh, idea most often, especially on the, um, you know, uh, one battle re I think it was recently put up was Tatingo, uh, Tarantingo, where the uh, Italian destroyer sinks HMS Mohawk, a tribal class destroyer, with a lucky torpedo shot in the middle of the night after she'd been disabled. And they thought that she was sinking and out of action. She still had a working. So she fires a spread of torpedoes and a torpedo lands in a spot it shouldn't. Be. Well, the exact worst spot. And then a second one lands and then the next worst spot and the poor destroyer gets sunk. The, the, his, the history of, oh, and then accidentally torpedo from a ship that's thought out of action seems to be uh, relatively storied. I know there are a couple of, couple of those happened at Jutland and, of course, uh, both Scharnhorst and Nice now end up eating torpedoes in their sinking of Glorious, um, yeah. although that is destroyers. Um, so that brings us on to our last question uh, for the moment, which is that given that uh, actually as, at the time of this recording, um, you obviously just done a video yesterday about fighting across the, across the world, um, but given that the Royal Navy ended up fighting more than just the the expected enemy of Japan, the the slightly less but by the end of the nineteen thirties expected enemy of Germany, and then having to throw the Italians into the mix as well. So they're now fighting three different uh, uh, navies, and the French get knocked out, so they don't have the French to help them in the Mediterranean or the west, the Eastern Atlantic. How did the Royal Navy's cruisers and cruiser doctrine stand up to the tests of World War II now that they're being dragged all across the planet to fight practically everybody the Royal Navy could have ever thought of fighting at the same time? To be honest, the cruiser doctrine stands up pretty well. The main problem the Royal Navy has is that they've, because of the effects of war, because of losing ships, They've had to modify the doctrine. They can't put it in full place. And they've also got problems in that there have been a lot of issues in terms of getting the cruisers properly put in and properly organized for what they want to be. Uh, the Royal Navy has a problem with getting the funding through. One of the reasons the town class becomes the town class is because the Royal Navy is fighting a big battle for getting the numbers of cruisers it needs. So, well, when I say financially stringent, I mean governments which are trying to get the most bang for their buck. So the Royal Navy is always thinking, what are we going to do in terms of what are we going to use it? The Royal Navy goes with a town class, names them town class, because the town class aren't going to get cancelled. Because no one's going to cancel a ship which is named Kitchen. That's the theory. I can't comment about the current Type 26 uh, uh, frigates and the Royal Navy's plans for that one, naming them city. But when they do get involved, they start off by having to react to the war. So they start off by recalling the town class cruisers from the Far East, the county class. And the cruisers going around the world get reduced. So they can't do the economic warfare they planned against the Japanese because they need those ships to do the economic warfare they planned against the Germans and the Italians. Which is fine, that's fitting in a doctrine, but the Royal Navy doesn't have enough of those ships in service to do what it needs to do. It's been taking a time to upgrade and to, because of treaty in part, but also because of government spending reduction, spending contingency, to, to get the ships in it needs. The destroyers try and step up and fill the wall, and certainly the tribal class destroyers in Norway, of course most famously the uh, but in various other things, are stepping up and filling in the role that you normally would cruise. So pretty much the conclusion is the Royal Navy cruiser doctrine stands up fairly well. It, the cruiser used as they're expected to be used. But the trouble is the Royal Navy never has enough of them available to really do all the stuff it needs to do. It never does achieve 70 cruisers. They want 70. They never do really achieve 70 cruisers because to get 70 working cruisers, you need, really need about 80 in service. 
because of maintenance, the refit, the training. So these things all have a factor. And yeah, so it works, but it can only ever work on a limited circumstance. It makes sense given that they're they have it as you say they're having to do do the best they can. It's sort of maximum enemies, not enough cruisers that that they wanted to have in the first place. And of course, everybody has the has the discourtesy to declare war at different times, meaning that uh, just when I know, you think you've got really the balance annoying. right, especially <laughs> the Royal Navy had, as again I discussed this yesterday, the Royal Navy's worst nightmare for World War Two would have been starting it for the Japanese to start it, the Royal Navy fleet to be in a transition to the Far East, and then the Italians piled in, and then the Germans joined in after the Italians. It happened. It, it actually turned out to be the exact opposite. But that meant the Royal Navy had had to withdraw forces from elsewhere to cover Europe. And then the Italians joined in. So then they had to withdraw forces to cover the Mediterranean. And then the Japanese joined in. And by that point, they've lost forces. They've got the forces all out of place. And the Royal Navy just going, oh, we now just hate you all. And then they scramble. They do put in a good force into the, into the Indian Ocean. They do put good forces out there. But they can't go and do the offensive operations, which they planned on doing. They can't do the economic warfare, which you do wonder if the Royal Navy had been doing the anti-merchant ship surface raiding, would the would the Japanese Navy have been able to do what it did to support the army in their movements towards Singapore? If the Japanese Navy hadn't been able to provide the support to the forces going around Singapore or going towards Singapore, the army would have been slowed down. That meant the British would have been far more organised, hopefully, by the time the defence of Singapore took place, which meant Singapore might not have fallen, and that then that changes all sorts of history. Yeah, I, I must admit, actually, it's um, I was uh, discussing this, I think, last week with uh, Military History Visualised. Uh, I don't know exactly when this video will go live, um, so if it has already, people might have seen that. If it has if his video hasn't gone live yet then spoilers but we were discussing the impact of the italian navy on uh world war ii because obviously there's a there's there is a tendency amongst some to sort of oh yeah the italians they weren't really up to much they're kind of the third wheel of the axis but um one of the points we did raise was the fact that um you know when when somerville goes into the indian ocean he has mostly r class plus war spite and and a handful of of carriers whereas you look at the several hundred ships that the Royal Navy and Royal Australian Navy have got pinned down trying to fend off the Italians in the Mediterranean, just how many carriers get cycled through there, how many battleships are operating there, and then you've got the cruisers and destroyers and the 100-plus ships that get lost in the Mediterranean to various enemy actions. You, and then you sit back and go, right, well, what could Somerville have done if he'd been in the Indian Ocean, but he'd got the majority of what the Royal Navy was committing to pinning the Italians down deployed with him. And then suddenly it's like, oh, hang on a minute, that's three or four armoured carriers, that's half a dozen, if not more, battleships, um, not including the R's, a, a lot more cruisers and destroyers. That's suddenly a force that's going to make the Japanese sit up and go, um, uh, hang on. <laughs> Yeah, it's in the nicest way. The Italian fleet is a has advantages of geography, and b which mean that they don't have to worry too much about long supply lines. And b they have this thing: the Royal Navy can't afford to not support the army. You know, as as Cunning puts it, it takes three years to build a ship, three hundred years to build a tradition. The army depends on the Royal Navy to get there, and depends on the Royal Navy securing its flank. You imagine the North African campaign if the Italian Navy had completely unfettered access to the North African coast. If the Royal Navy hadn't been managing to get the supplies backwards and forwards to Malta, if the Royal Navy hadn't been making the Italian Navy have to keep thinking so that the Italian Navy couldn't force its way through. And again, that's another issue. OK, it might sound like a long shot, but what would have happened if the Italian Navy had managed to force its way out of the Mediterranean? got to the French coast and linked up with the Scharnhorst and Eisenau and linked up with the powerful German force. And you suddenly got a German-Italian task force in the Atlantic. Now, it never happens. And actually, it happening would have been an extreme long shot. And there were 
the Royal Navy put in all sorts of forces in place to stop that happening and actually being a possibility. But if that sort of task force had been in the Atlantic, that's a very scary prospect for the Royal Navy to deal with. So that's yeah. why the Royal Navy puts the force it does in place. Yeah. So, well, yeah, that, on, on that note, uh, I think we can, can wrap up this video. It's uh, certainly been very interesting. I hope everyone else who's listening is finding it very interesting as well. And uh, let me know in the comments below what you what you think. And uh, if if you if you're liking this format, we can hopefully revisit it with uh, maybe looking at full time cruisers in more depth, post war cruisers. Who knows? I'm, I'm sure uh, Doctor Clark has many things he will be quite happy to discuss when it comes to uh, the Royal Navy and its uh, its technology and tactics throughout this period. Well, I, I do basically live in a library. Uh, I like yeah. these in archives so what I dwell in. They are lovely places. Yeah. Okay. So I will um I will we'll wrap this video up here. So thank you very much for your time and thank you everyone else for listening and hope to see you again on another thank video. Thank you very much. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.